I want to show you today from the Bible that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is not a trinity. You can go back to Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is three in one. No, the Lord our God is one Lord. One, just one. You say, well, uh, what's the New Testament say? The New Testament is Trinitarian. Uh, actually, you can go in there in a, if you have a King James Bible. Look up Mark chapter 12. If you are Jewish, you will be surprised to find that a lot of what you think about Christianity is actually not even in this King James Bible. Uh, most what Jews I've ever run into or whatever I had discussions with, um, they think Catholicism is Christianity and Catholicism is not. Catholicism is a, a pagan philosophical uh, governmental system that steals words from the Bible and then says we're the ones that founded the Christian church. Absolute nonsense. Mark chapter 12, verse 28 and 29. <clears throat> and one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together, and perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, Which is the first commandment of all? Look what Jesus responds. And Jesus answered him, The first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. So Jesus Christ didn't bring in a trinity. Jesus Christ is not part of some trinity that comes in and replaces what the Bible says back in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 6. Jesus Christ reaffirms it. He quotes that passage. There's one Lord. And I'm going to show you who Jesus Christ is, you know, truly from the pages of the King James Bible, not the uh, pagan philosophical concepts of the Catholic Church. I'll show you this later on too to show you where the whole trinity thing came from. Go back to Exodus chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3. <clears throat> Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush, and said, Moses, Moses, and he said, Here am I. And he said, Draw not nigh hither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place wherein thou stand, whereon thou standest is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Jacob, or Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon the, the holy trinity that was there, the three that, no, to look upon God, one Lord, one God, not three, just one. Okay, interesting, because you see over there, in verse 2, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. The angel of the Lord is often a reference to God himself appearing to man. All right, He appears to Moses. Uh, Moses was definitely a very, very holy man, obviously. But Moses doesn't say, um, well, you're just one of three. There's, a, there's two other parts to you or whatever. He says, I'm afraid to look upon God, one, being there. Not three people. You know, the other two weren't sitting up in heaven or some other place, whatever. Just one. Look at uh, verse 13. Exodus chapter 3, verse 13. And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers hath sent me unto you, and they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. Okay, that's a title, a very holy title of God. And it's it's really the only title, the only thing that a, a eternal being could say, an eternal God could say, I am. 
You say, where were you in the past? I am. Where are you right now? I am. Or where are you going to be at in the future? I am. He's eternal. It's just, he's always there. I am that I am. Very important to get that. Remember that. We're going to get back to that later. Luke chapter 20. Go back to the New Testament here. We'll see what Jesus has to say about this whole thing. Luke chapter 20, verse 37 through 47. It says here, Now that the dead are raised, even Moses showed at the bush, when he called the Lord the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. For he is not a God of the dead, but of the living, for all live unto him. Then certain of the scribes answering said, Master, thou hast well said. And they after that, they durst not ask him any questions at all. And he said unto them, How say they that Christ is David's son? And David himself saith in the book of Psalms, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand, till I make thine enemies thy footstool. David therefore calleth him Lord. How is he then his son? See, speaking of prophetic references back in the book of Psalms to the coming Messiah. And he's saying, he's saying, he's a son, but I'm going to call him Lord. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord? Just one? Hmm. How can he sit on the right hand of God? If he's just one. Okay? And it's an interesting study. I did a whole study on the thing of, of this statement in Scripture about him sitting on the right hand of God. You know, the Son sitting on the right hand of God. You know, it's an interesting study. I'm not going to get into it all right now, but you can look up that study if you want all the details on that. But let's continue here. Um, then in the audience of all the people, he said unto his disciples, Beware of the scribes which desire to walk in long robes and love greetings in the markets and in, in the highest seats in the synagogues and the chief rooms at feasts, which devour widows' houses and for a show make long prayers. The, shame, the same shall receive greater damnation. Um, the Catholic Church is also very good at that. You could just say, instead of beware of the scribes, you could say beware of the Catholic priests or beware of the cardinals or beware of the pope or whatever else. Yeah. Um, organized religion is an abomination, All right? So uh, you say, well, uh, so Rabbi so-and-so, um, organized religion. And by the way, a lot of the Jews at the top, a lot of these rabbis and things, not all of them, not all of them, but there's Jews at the top. So the higher level rabbis, there's one down in uh, um, New York. I cannot think of the guy's name right now, but he actually has received a Catholic knighthood. And a lot of these higher level rabbis, um, are actually yoked up to the Catholic Church. There's a confirming a covenant that's going to be happening in the future between the Jews and the Catholics. Um, the Catholics are your enemies if you're Jewish. Okay? You say, what did you say? I said the Catholics are your enemies. The greatest enemy of a, Jew, of a Jew is a Catholic. You say, well, I thought about a Christian. No. Catholics are not Christians. All right? Christians are your greatest uh, ally. Bible-believing Christians love the Jewish people. We love the nation of Israel. Uh, we have never persecuted the Jewish people. Uh, why would we? Uh, let's continue. But what about this thing? Why would David call uh, him, the, the Lord, a son? Let's look about that. Psalm 110. Let's go back to that reference. Psalm 110. There's a lot of tie-ins between Old Testament and New Testament. The New Testament is not some kind of a horrible book that puts down the Jews or whatever else. Not at all. Psalm 110, verses 1 and 2. The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Notice it says until. I'll give you a little hint into the whole thing there. Um, the biblical teaching on the Godhead, on the Lord there is, man is created in God's image. What is man made up of? Body, soul, spirit. Okay? So there's three different things, but just one man. You're looking at me right now. I have a body that you're looking at, and I have a soul and a spirit. All right? Three different things, but you're just I'm just one man. All right? You say, well, then how does that work? He's sitting up there on the right hand of the Father. The Son sits at the right hand of the Father. How does that work? Well, the body and the soul and the spirit can separate. That's the interesting thing, the, the mystery of, of godliness that you see in Scripture. They can separate. 
All right, and of course, when you die, your soul and your spirit, as a, in the New Testament teaches, your soul and your spirit go to be with the Lord. Your body is left on the earth until the resurrection. If you're Jewish, you will believe that you basically sleep and um, your body and soul and spirit, I guess, are sleeping and you're waiting for the resurrection as well. Right? You're waiting for the Messiah to come so that you can be resurrected. I've studied a little bit about uh, the, you know, the Jewish belief system. Verse 2, The Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. So there's rule coming for the Messiah, the Son of God that's written about there. Um, let's continue. Go to Psalm chapter 2. Or Psalm chapter 2. Psalm 2. <laughs> Excuse me. Used to say in chapter. But let's go to Psalm 2, verses 6 through 12. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree the Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. A begotten son of God? Yeah, hmm. Read John chapter 3, verse 16 to see who that is. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron, thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings, be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear, and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the sun, lest he be angry, and ye perish from the way, when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. Hmm. Trusting in a son that's begotten of God. Hmm, that's an interesting thing. And I've seen, I did a whole study on the thing of a Jewish rabbi's objections to, to Jesus Christ being the Messiah. And so I've read some of the things that the Orthodox Jews put out, and they say, well, you know, that the Messiah is just going to be a regular man, he's not divine, and whatever else. Uh, well, I hate to tell you, but yes, he is divine. And if you study the thing out, you say, well, he has to be a descendant of Solomon, or whatever else. Uh, no, because Jeconiah sinned, and so God cut off that line and said nobody's going to sit on the throne after Jeconiah. All right? And again, I, did a, I had that all, all the scriptures laid out in my study, um, answering Jewish rabbis' objection, objections to Jesus. All right? So there's a, there's a bunch of problems there. If you want to try to say that the Messiah, the Jewish Messiah, is going to be a mortal man. No, he's not. Okay? This is, you know, obviously he's begotten right there in Psalm 2, verse 7. The Son is begotten. I'm going to show you something even better than that. Isaiah chapter 7. Isaiah 7, verse 14 through 16. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Butter and honey shall he eat, that he may know to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the child shall know to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land that thou abhorrest shall be forsaken of both her kings. Okay, um, A lot of the new versions, the ones that come from the Vatican, uh, the wicked, corrupted Bible perversions that are out there, they will change virgin to young woman. In other words, the Lord himself shall give you a sign, behold, a young woman shall conceive. Uh, what kind of a sign is that? That's a rather lame sign. Every young woman, uh, you know, there's a lot of young women, I should say. There's women in their older age, and they conceive too, but young women conceive all the time. That's not a sign. A sign is a virgin shall conceive. You say, well, we, re we reject what happened back there with Mary and things. We don't think that that was true and whatever else, and we think it was fornication that led up to that and whatever. Okay, but uh, Jesus proved quite a few things, and I'm going to show you the tie-ins here. Um, no, the fact of the matter is that that virgin that conceived happened back in the first century. And again, she was a Jewish uh, young woman. She was not this pagan goddess of the Catholic Church that they worship. And they'll say, we don't worship her, we venerate her. <laughs> okay, <laughs> whatever. You know, absurd. But go to Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. And here's where it gets very interesting. It says here, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. A son, a child, a young 
a, excuse me, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. Call his name Emmanuel, God with us, in other words. Not the Trinity with us. Okay? Um, it's God with us. For unto us, a son, uh, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Now I know, you know, as a Jew you'll say, well, you see, Jesus couldn't be the Messiah because he didn't fulfill verse 7. There. He didn't bring in the kingdom and things and whatever else. Yeah, but it's because they rejected him as their Messiah. The Jews back there in the first century rejected him. They said, we'll have no king but Caesar. Yoking up with Rome. Still doing it today. Know what I mean? Still going to confirm that covenant there in the future, back in the book of Daniel. Confirm the covenant with these wicked heathen right here, these Catholics. It's a bad thing that the Jews are doing. Um, Jesus Christ you know, came and, and offered himself as the king. They rejected. Right? And, you know, again... Can't get into all that stuff there. It's a whole other study. But my point is, you look at verse 6. This is key to this whole thing. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And his name shall be called the Everlasting Father. Wait a second. A son is given, and you'll call him the Everlasting Father? He can be son and father at the same time? You say, well, well this, is, this is called modalism. This is modalism. No, modalism is a rather foolish thing that says that, that God appears and he can change modes and he's just one guy there and he goes and, and he'll be the son here and then he goes back up to heaven and he can be the father and then he over to here and he can be the Holy Spirit and, and whatever. And it's so easy to debunk that because Jesus Christ is praying to his father in heaven when he's being baptized. You know, the father speaks from heaven and the Holy Spirit descends like a dove in a bodily form like a dove. It doesn't say he's a dove. Okay? So, you know, how do you get three modes out of that? That's a problem. Modalism is a heresy. A lot of people try to say I teach modalism. I have never taught modalism. Okay, what the Bible teaches is that we are made in the image and likeness of God. Body, soul, spirit. All right? And as I said earlier, at death, I leave my body. Somebody comes and shoots me right now, my body falls on the ground, my soul and my spirit go up to be with the Lord. They're separate. All right? And you can see a struggle as a Christian. You can see the struggle between your body of flesh and your soul and your spirit. There's a great struggle there. And there's, you know, different times in, in Scripture. There's actually the rich man in the New Testament, and he says, I said to myself, soul, and he starts talking to himself. The body of flesh talking to the soul. So, um, yes, Jesus Christ can be praying down there to the soul up in heaven, the Father. And yet he can be Son and Father at the same time. His name is called the Everlasting Father. Unless you're a Trinitarian, then you just reject that. Because you're a pagan. And your beliefs are based on philosophy. But now, now let's go to the New Testament. We'll see what Jesus has to say about this. Did Jesus Christ claim to be the Father? Did Jesus Christ fulfill the scriptures, the prophecy about the Messiah being God manifest in the flesh? John chapter 8, verse 12, down to verse 32. We'll read a bunch of verses here. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. The Pharisees therefore said unto him, Thou bearest record of thyself. Thy record is not true. Jesus answered and said unto them, Though I bear record of myself, yet my record is true, for I know whence I came, and whither I go, but ye cannot tell whence I came, come, and whither I go. Ye judge after the flesh, I judge no man. And yet if I judge, my judgment is true, for I am not alone, but I am the Father that sent me. It is also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. I am one that bear witness of myself, and the Father that sent me beareth witness of me. They said unto him, Where is thy father? Jesus answered, Ye neither know me nor my father. If ye had known me, ye should have known my father also. 
They said, where's your father? Well, if you know me, you know my father. Hmm. These words spake Jesus in the treasury as he taught in the temple, and no man, man laid hands on him, for his hour was not yet come. Then said Jesus again unto them, I go my way, and ye shall seek me, and shall die in your sins. Whither I go, ye cannot come. And sadly, that's the condition of Jews right now. Um, you're seeking for the Messiah. All right? You've rejected Jesus. You say, well, no, Jesus, because, and, and, and again, I have so much sympathy for Jews because you see, you see this Jesus. This is not the Jesus of this book. This is a fake Jesus. This is a fraud that they present, that these papists present. All right? But look at, look at that verse. I go my way and ye shall seek me. You seek after the Messiah. And shall die in your sins. What atonement do you have to pay for your sins right now if you're a Jew? You can't sacrifice animals. You do that, you get in trouble over in Israel. How do you make atonement for your sins? you got to hope that you have a son that can pray for you and everything else and do alms and whatever. You know, you gotta, you got to hope that you have a son so that you'll be able to be resurrected. Sad. You'll die in your sins. Whither I go, you cannot come. You're not going to go to heaven when you die if you reject Jesus Christ. Verse 22, Then said the Jews, Will he kill himself? Because he saith, Whither I go, ye cannot come. And he said unto them, Ye are from beneath. I am from above, ye are of this world, and I am not of this world. I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins, for, here we go, if ye believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. You see, I reject this thing of Jesus Christ being the Father. I, I, I can't accept that. You know, this is heresy. I'm a Trinitarian. I'm a proud Trinitarian. Uh, okay, you're going to die in your sins. Oh, it, well, it was true for the Jews there, but it was not true. it's not true for somebody who calls themselves a Christian. Sure, right. You've got to deny a whole lot of scriptures if you want to teach this Trinitarian stuff, especially because the word Trinity is not even in the Bible. We'll talk about that later. Verse 25, Then said they unto him, Who art thou? And Jesus saith unto them, Even the same that I said unto you from the beginning. I have many things to say and to judge of you, but he that sent me is true, and I speak to the world those things which I have heard of him. They understood not that he spake to them of the Father. Then said Jesus unto them, When ye have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall ye know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things. And he that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that please him. As he spake these words, many believed on, to, on him. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Yeah. Jesus isn't somehow... I mean, think about this Trinitarian thing, why it's so wicked. Um, you have basically three different people, okay? Totally separate people, each one with their body, own body, soul, and spirit. Body, soul, spirit, body, soul, spirit. They each have their own thing. Father, Son, Holy Ghost, okay? Three separate people. Yet they're all going around claiming that they are the one true God. How does that work? How does that even... It just boggles the mind. And yet the Old Testament says there's just one Lord. And elsewhere it says about there's just one Savior. All right? Uh, not, well, there's, you know, three, but they're, they're, they're just one in, in unity and the one... In, and you have to, if you teach the Trinity, you have to invent all kinds of extra-biblical language, stuff that doesn't even appear in the King James Bible, to teach this heresy of the Trinity. It's warped. But let's continue. Go down to verse 54 in John chapter 8. John chapter 8, verse 54 through 59. Jesus answered, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my Father that honoreth me, of whom ye say that he is your God. Yet ye have not known him, but I know him, and if I should say I know him not, I shall be a liar like unto you. Yet Jesus spoke plainly. But I know him and keep his saying. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Mm -hmm. Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? Jesus, saith, or Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. Uh-oh. He uses the Father's title. 
He didn't say, um, before Abraham was, um, I'm, it's kind of like my father says I am, but I can't say that because I'm not my father. Uh, no, he uses God's title, the father's title, I am. And look at their reaction. Then took they up stones to cast at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. Hmm. They knew exactly what he meant. Okay? He was calling himself the Father. If ye believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. Hmm. Oh, but, we, you know, that's, that's heresy if you teach those things today to a Catholic Trinitarian. How sad. John chapter 10, verse 27. Turn over there. John chapter 10, verse 27 through 33. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Jesus speaking here. You're not going to pluck any of his sheep out of his hand. Verse 29. My Father, which gave them me, is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. You see, he just said about, no man can pluck them out of my hand, and then he says, no man can pluck them out of my Father's hand. So, you know, I've said this before in other studies, um, is, are they playing, you know, juggle the, the Christian, you know? They're kind of throwing the Christian back and forth or something. It's in Jesus' hand, and it drops over to the Father's hand, and just kind of, they juggle the Christian, they kind of throw and play and catch with the Christian. Uh, no, you know, Christian catch. <laughs> no, that's not it. You say, well, are, you, are you trying to say that they're one and the same? Oh, I don't know. Let's keep reading. Verse 30. I and my Father are one. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Just one. I believe in the Holy Trinity then you don't believe in anything that appears in the King James Bible. Just as simple as that. John chapter 14. And believe me, I could, I could make, I'm, I'm eventually going to be doing a, a major um, documentary on this whole Trinity issue, going through all the scriptures, just debunking this pagan Trinity concept. It's just so foul and disgusting. John chapter 14, verse 1 through 18 let not your heart be troubled. Do you believe in God? Believe also in me. wonder why that would be. Well, because they're the same. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And whither I go ye know, and the way ye know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Yeah. If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also, and from henceforth ye know him, and have seen him. Uh, I thought the Bible teaches that you can't see the Father. Hmm. How is Jesus saying that you can see the Father. You've seen Him. Verse 8, Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? Show us the Father, and it will suffice us. I've been so long time with you, and you don't know me? Look what Jesus says. He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? Well, they say, the Trinitarian, the pagans, they come out and they say, well, see, when he says that, he's talking about that they're in unity. It kind of, if, you know, if you've seen me, you've seen, you know, I work for um, uh, Ford Motor Corporation. So if you've seen me, you've seen Ford, Ford Motor Corporation. No, 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 no. That's not what he's saying. Nowhere are you going to see, in essence, in unity. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Why? Because you're looking at the body of Jesus, and yet the soul's right inside there. The soul's the Father. The Holy Ghost is the Spirit. How does everything work out, and how does it, how do they look, and how do they, you know, that's the mystery there. 
but the scriptures are perfectly clear. There is no trinity with three different people walking around. Okay, it's one God, one Lord. Trinitarians have a real hard time with, you know, mathematics, apparently. They can't count. One means one, right? Not three separate people all lying and saying, I'm the one true God. It's kind of a weird situation. Verse 10. Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me. He doeth the works. The Father that dwelleth in me? So, well, this is in essence. It, it, there's no words in essence there. In unity, it, it's not there. The Father dwells inside Jesus Christ. And we're going to see later on in the book of Colossians, it says about Jesus and Christ, it says, In him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Every part of the Godhead just in one man. Hero Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. One. I and my Father are one. Let's continue. Verse 11. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Glorified in the Son. Get that one. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. If ye love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father. And here's the, the other part of the Godhead. Okay. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may be able to abide with you forever. Okay. Even the Spirit of Truth whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know, know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. Now look at this. This is interesting. It's talking about the Holy Spirit there, the Spirit of truth there in verse 17. But look at verse 18. Jesus doesn't say, yeah, I'm going to send him. He's, he's around here somewhere. Did anybody see a white dove flying around? I don't... There's a, there's a gray one over there. Where's the white dove? He didn't say that. Okay? He's dealing with himself. He's talking about himself. How do you know? Verse 18. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. You say, well, no, well then he's the comforter he's talking about there is, is himself, Jesus. But if you look at uh, verse 26 of the same chapter, but the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. The Comforter is the Holy Ghost. And yet Jesus says, I will come to you. In him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Jesus Christ is God. Completely, holy God. It's right there. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And his name shall be called the everlasting Father. The Son and the Father are the same being. They're separate in the sense of body and soul. That's true. They're not one God in three different modes, right? That he can shapeshift or something like this. No. One God that consists of three parts. Body, soul, spirit. Man is created in the image of God. Body, soul, spirit. Just plain as day unless you're a lost, you know, pagan Catholic. Acts chapter 3. Go in the Bible to Acts chapter 3. You have the first number of verses there, down to verse 11. Peter uh, basically heals a man, a man that's lame, and everybody's praising Peter for it. And this is what he says here, Acts chapter 3, verse 12. And when Peter saw it, he answered unto the people, Ye men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? Or why look so ye excuse me, why look why look ye so earnestly on us, as though by our own power or holiness we had made this man to walk? The God of Abraham, and of Isaac, and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, hath glorified his son Jesus, whom ye delivered up, and denied him in the presence of Pilate, when he was determined to let him go. But ye denied the holy three and the just. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, I read it wrong. It's uh, the Holy Trinity, the Most Holy Trinity. Uh, no, it's actually the Holy 
one. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. You denied the Holy One. You see, but it says Son. See, it's, it's God the Father and then God the Son. You know, there's no term God the Son in the entire King James Bible. I'd like to also point out the fact they say, you know, this is heresy to call Jesus the Father. Uh, where did Jesus ever say, I'm not the Father? Argue from the negative, okay? Jesus Christ never said, somebody come up and say, my Lord, my God, Thomas. He didn't say, oh, whoa, hold on. Let me clarify, okay? I'm the Son. I'm not the Father. Jesus never said, I'm not the Father. He never corrected anybody. Hey, make sure that you don't ever call me God the Father, okay? Because I'm not Him. That's not anything that Jesus ever did. All right? And we saw already from Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, that He can be Son and Father. He bears the title of the Everlasting Father. And so, you know, the Trinitarians have to come up with two fathers, apparently. You know, that Jesus is called Father somehow, and then you have God the Father. He's a Father, too. And they get, they get so mixed up in the Scriptures. They get so just all over the place. And I'll show you why here in just a little bit, where their uh, mixed up minds come from. But let's continue. Verse 15, And killed the Prince of Life, whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. And his name, through faith in his name, hath made this man strong, whom ye see and know. Yea, the faith which is by him hath given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. And now, brethren, I wot that through ignorance ye did it, as did also your rulers. But those things which God uh, before had showed by the mouth of all his prophets, that Christ should suffer, he hath so fulfilled. Jesus Christ fulfilled those parts of the, you know, Isaiah chapter 53 and things. He fulfilled that. The millennial inheritance and the ruling and things and, and, and all that. He hasn't done that yet, okay? He has a reason for all of that. And the time of Jacob's trouble is coming up uh, not too far off into the future. And there, you're going to get to see the book of Revelation coming to pass and how it ties in with the book of uh, Daniel. And uh, Jesus Christ comes back at the end of it to put an end to all the heathen nations out there and to the heathen Trinitarians. But uh, verse 19, Repent there, repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. And Moses truly said unto the fathers, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren, like unto me. Him shall ye hear in all things, whatsoever he shall say unto you. And it shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. Yea, and all the prophets from Samuel and those that follow after, as many as, as have spoken, have likewise foretold of these days. Ye are the children of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying unto Abraham, And in thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. Unto you first God, which having raised up his son Jesus, uh, send him to bless you in turning away every one of you from his iniquities. Um, is that needed in Israel today? Jews turning away from iniquity? Yeah. A lot of wicked people out there. A lot of wicked uh, Jews and things. you got a real sin problem over there. How do you make atonement for those sins? How do you do it? Well, my rabbi said, uh, what does the Bible say? What's the Bible say? So, again, you know, and, and let me just say this. If you notice, uh, there's nothing in there saying that uh, the seed now, the physical seed is now no longer the Jews. It's now the church and whatever else, this replacement theology lie that, uh, again, comes from a certain source. That's not in there. Now we're going to go to the book of Colossians. You have Peter speaking to the Jews there in Acts chapter 3. But we're going to see what, the, what was sent to the Gentiles. Colossians chapter 1, verse 12. Let's start there. Giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. Hmm. So you have the Father in verse 12, the Son in verse 13. 
in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. You say, well, that's talking about Jesus Christ. Yeah, it is. But Acts chapter 20, verse 28 also says, God purchased us with his own blood. And you say, well, that's God the Son. It doesn't say that. Again, people have to add to Scripture. Hmm. Verse 15. Talking about Jesus here. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. Who was it that showed up there in the Old Testament? The angel of the Lord to Moses in the bush. And yet Moses doesn't say, oh, that's one of the, that's the, the first member of the Trinity. Or he says, that's God. Jesus Christ shows up on the earth. God manifests in the flesh. He's the image of the invisible God. Hmm. Verse 16. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. If Jesus is a separate man than the Father and the Holy Spirit, then that means the Father and the Holy Spirit have to consist by Jesus Christ, which would make them lesser. If Jesus Christ dies, the Father and the Spirit both die, because by Him all things consist. Or they could be the same being. You see? And Jesus dies on the cross. It's not the third person of the Trinity or the second person of the Trinity or something like this. No, it's the body dying. Just like somebody comes along and they kill me. Bang! My body dies and hits the ground and I have to wait for the resurrection my body of flesh, but my soul and spirit goes up to be with the Lord. So the soul and spirit can be up there in heaven, the Father, the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ dies on the cross. Verse 18, And he is the head of the body of the church, who is the beginning of the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. Hmm. So Jesus has preeminence over the Father? Uh, no, He has preeminence because He is the Father. He's the Son that was given and the everlasting Father. One being. Verse 20, And having made peace through the blood of His cross, by Him to reconcile all things unto Himself, by Him I say whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, Yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. If ye continue in the faith grounded and settled and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which ye have heard and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. You study out the New Testament. Peter is sent to the Jews. Paul is sent to the Gentiles. All right. That's the way the thing works. But let's finish up here. Colossians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. You say, well, yeah, the, the Trinity is not in the Old Testament. You know, if you're Jewish, you understand that. There's no Trinity there. And I can demonstrate to you there's no Trinity in the New Testament. Uh, that word was created by Tertullian, a pagan philosopher, which we'll talk about here in just a minute. Um, they actually admit it right in the Catechism. Okay? But, uh, so where did this whole thing come from? Colossians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. That describes where the Trinity concept came from. The Bible's finished, and uh, all of a sudden, God up in heaven, and he says, Oh, oh, nuts. I forgot. I wanted to be called Trinity. And I wanted to be called, you know, three persons, and I wanted to say a divine essence, and and oh, I should have said God the Son, God the Spirit, three in one, you know, all this stuff. You know, the Bible does say God the Father, so that's good. But we missed God the Son, we missed God the Spirit. Uh, you know, I'm just gonna have to get a, a faithful church to uh, come up with those things and explain my state of being through philosophy. Uh, no, that's not the God of the Bible, okay? That's the God of pagan philosophy over here, a false God. 
Look at verse 9. Verse 8 ends with Christ. Verse 9, For in Him, Jesus Christ, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. One man and all the fullness of the Godhead is right in Him. Jesus Christ the body, God the Father the soul, the Holy Ghost the Spirit, but one. How does everything work out? I, I really don't know. Uh, how does it all, you know, him standing on the right hand of God and, you know, all that other stuff and how does it look and how does it, you know, I don't know. There's a lot of things. The mystery of godliness is great, the Bible says. But uh, I do know that it's the Godhead. Um, that's the three, just three parts, but one being. Here, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. I and my Father are one. You crucified the Holy One. Don't ever fall for the pagan trinity. And just in case you say, well, I don't know about this stuff. And by the way, just let me say this. Back there in the first century, the majority of Christians were Jews. Okay? And they rejected the trinity. There was no such thing. All right? Paul warns the Gentiles about philosophers. And so what happens? Well, you have a few centuries go by. The Bible's completed and Jewish Christians are disseminating, disseminating it and everything. And you have this Roman, pagan Roman government basically saying, well, you know, we're going to, this Christianity thing's growing very well, so let's take over that. Let's usurp the movement. And of course, the devil was the one really behind the whole thing. It, it wasn't just some political move or whatever else. It was Satan uh, did this whole thing. But he said, we, in order to attract the pagans, we're going to have to bring in a lot of philosophy. A lot of the Greek philosophical terms, Catholic in it is itself a Greek philosophical term, and we got to bring on all this pagan philosophy together and pagan gods and whatever else and, and holy days and everything. we got to bring all this stuff together and then make it, give it Christian names. That's what Roman Catholicism is. But I'm going to read it to you right here. The Holy Trinity and the Teaching of the Faith. This is page 74, number 249 in the Roman Catholic Catechism. I'll show you here in just a minute after I'm done reading it. The Holy Trinity and the Teaching of the Faith. The Formation of the Trinitarian Dogma. Not just a, well, you know, we kind of can agree to disagree. No, it's a dogma of the faith. From the very beginning, the revealed truth of the Holy Trinity has been at the very root of the church's living faith, principally by means of baptism. Hmm. We did a study a while back on the uh, RCIA, um, and they actually came out and they talked about whether or not different churches' baptisms are valid whether they're baptized into the you know the universal church, the Catholic church, and they said as long as they say you're baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, you gotta you gotta recognize the Trinity in baptism to be considered legitimate. And they actually brought up Baptists and they said as long as they're doing you know using the Trinity, Trinitarian type Baptists, we accept their baptism is valid. Showed the proof. Number 250, during the first centuries of the church sought to clarify its Trinitarian faith. They try to pretend that they were the ones that were around and they go back to the apostles and everything else. Absolute lie. They were there, but it was the Roman government system. And then they decided that they're just going to usurp the movement. This clarification was the work of the early councils aided by the theological work of the, work of the church fathers and sustained by the Christian people's sense of the faith. <laughs> Unreal. So what they did is, these pagan Romans come along and they look and they say, wow, this Christianity thing's really growing. Let's usurp the movement. We're dying as a, as a governmental power. And so, you know, Book of Daniel, the, the, the legs of iron, the two legs of iron that Nebuchadnezzar sees and Daniel interprets the vision, the two legs of iron are the eastern, western branches of the Roman Empire. And what do they do? Do they just dissolve and just, and they're gone? No, they merge into ten toes. Hmm, part iron, part miry clay. It's talking about that merger of the fourth kingdom into, it merges into the fifth kingdom, part strong, part weak, and that's what the Catholic Church has been down through the centuries. They're gaining in strength right now, unfortunately. Um, but that fifth kingdom has been in place since, you know, 300 AD or so, well, three, you know, maybe the 4th century, we'll say. They've been in power since then. And here we are today. 
but they what they did is they came in and they said we'll take these pagan philosophers and which the teaching of a trinity goes back to ancient Egypt, ancient Babylon. They taught three gods and they're actually just one in essence and whatever else. And I'm going to show you the proof of it. I'm not making it up. And they take their pagan philosophers and they call them church fathers. And you read some of the stuff that these church fathers believed in. It, they're just blasphemous. They were terrible. Number 251. In order to articulate the dogma of the Trinity, the church had to develop its own terminology with the help of certain notions of philosophical origin. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy. The Apostle Paul writes, We got our stuff from philosophical origin. Substance, person, or hypostasis, relation, and so on. In doing this, she did not submit the faith to human wisdom. Yes, she did but gave a new and unprecedented means, meaning to these terms, which from then on would be used to signify an, an ineffable mystery, infinitely beyond all that we can humanly understand. The church uses the term substance, rendered also at times by essence or nature, to designate the divine being in its unity. Right, here you go. Okay, Catechism of the Catholic Church. All of the official Catholic things up there, nothing objectionable. This is the official beliefs of the Catholic Church, and they admit we got it all, the Trinitarian thing, we got it from pagan philosophy. And you will see people that call themselves Christians, and they will use those same exact pagan philosophical terms. They'll say, when it says the Lord our God is one Lord, they'll, they'll say, it means one in nature, one in essence, divine essence, one in unity. That's what they're talking about. The Catechism admits it doesn't come from the Bible. These terms don't come from Holy Scripture. They come from philosophical origin. The pagan church fathers, Tertullian, created the term Trinity. The Trinity is not the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And the Trinity is not my God as a Bible-believing Christian, a born-again Bible-believing Christian. Um, I'm not the enemy of the Jewish people. I'm a friend to the nation of Israel. This city is where God is going to rule one day physically in the flesh in Jesus Christ. He is the Son, and He is also, His name shall be called the Everlasting Father. There's not two fathers, there's only one. There's not two sons, there's only one. There's not two spirits, there's only one. Okay? And the Bible says in 1 John chapter 5, verse 7, these three are one. Okay? Please, if you're Jewish, do not uh, think poorly of Christianity and say, I don't want to study Christianity because your mind's been poisoned by this nonsense right here. And your mind's been poisoned by the things that were done to you by Catholics down through the centuries. The most recent, of course, horror was the Holocaust in Nazi Germany. Um, you look at that thing, you study it, um, the Nazi Germany there, the the Reichstag, they, they signed a concordat with the Pope before the war began. Uh, all the high Nazi officials were Roman Catholics. Every single one of them, they weren't Christians. So don't say, well, the, the Christians have persecuted us. Christians have never persecuted you. All right. What the Bible says about how the Jews have turned against God and they are the enemies of Christians right now, well, that's true. But it doesn't say that we're supposed to go out and kill you. All right? So... I really do pray that you understand these issues and um, study this thing out. Study it out that your Messiah is not going to be coming as a, as a mortal man. Your Messiah has to be God manifest in the flesh. He's the only one that can redeem Israel. And Jesus Christ, He's the one that fills that position. He's the Son 
but he's also the everlasting father. They're the same being. Okay? That is going to be it. I pray you look into these things. And don't be deceived by Trinitarian papists. Thank you for watching.